Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Rob Morrison. I started out uh, in 1989 as a young, aspiring scientist and probably similar to some of you today, wondering what, uh, what the world held for me. Um, we had just gone through an administration change in 88, and uh, I did what was natural for me, but perhaps not natural for many of you, and that is I went straight into industry. Um, Ricky asked me to talk about uh, maybe what you might be facing. Um, from an economic standpoint, and I thought, well, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think if you are at a, a precipice in your life or a big change, it's important to sort of step back. So what we're going to talk about is, is whether or not to start out, in other words, go into industry, maybe go back into academia, potentially start up, start up a company, but what are the, maybe the things that you can, should consider before making that decision, okay? So the way I've, the way I've structured this um, is to talk about the entrepreneur in general. What's the starting point? And the starting point is you, uh, fundamentally. You know, who are you? What are you interested in? What's the context within which you're going to operate? Um, and then perhaps through the gestation or the development of an idea, uh, talk about a business. And what's the context of that business? And then finally, uh, the economic environment that that business is going to be thrust into or participating in. Okay, so that's, that's the way I've structured it. If you all want to ask questions, please just raise your hand. This is not a monologue. I'm not preaching up here. I just want to have a good time and, and tell you a little bit about um, what I think is important to consider. So uh, by way of um, maybe a little bit of interaction, can anybody point out the entrepreneur on this page? Go ahead, anybody. Dude on the top left. The dude on the top left. Okay, that's one answer. <laughs> anybody else? Who? All of them. Okay, we got to vote for all of them. E, all of the above. Anybody else? Okay, we got two. So the dude in the top left and all of the above. Any uh, any betters in the audience? <laughs> who's going dude in the top left? Nobody. One guy. Hopefully the guy who mentioned it. Okay, who's going all of the above? <clears throat> all right, all of the above wins the lotto. So in 2008, these are the best entrepreneurs according to Entrepreneur Magazine for 25 and under. Uh, the point of this slide is you can't really tell, although somebody did, uh, what an entrepreneur looks like. So what are, how are they packaged? What do they look like? What are their interests? Um, this wasn't meant to be an all-male slide. It just so happens to be uh, the top five were all men. And you can see that they started businesses in all uh, sorts of areas. This guy, Johnny Cupcakes, has, I think, three uh, locations, one in L.A., one in Boston. Um, he's got a couple international sites. Fantastic, 26 years old. Came out and just decided to make some baker, baked goods. Uh, campus Live is a, a website trying to get uh, uh, people involved with their campus community. So it's a very school-oriented or university-oriented website. A little bit different than the social sites you see today in Facebook and MySpace. Um, CML Studios, Carlos Leon. This is kind of an interesting case study. He's going up against uh, the big picture studios and doing a very good job right now. So all of these people are entrepreneurs, as one person and many of you bet with figured out. So one question may be, if you're in the sciences, are you an inventor or an entrepreneur? Who's an inventor? Anybody an inventor in the room? One, maybe. Why? So he said he feels more like that than an entrepreneur. Why? Okay, good. That's one way to start. A lot of great ideas, not well, well connected. Anybody else? Entrepreneur versus inventor. Any ideas? Okay, well, it's important. It's an, it's an important concept to sort of think about, especially if you're coming out of the sciences. So um, this is one quote. Our research shows that most entrepreneurs who reach their goals are often natural leaders, strong problem solvers, and they work well under pressure. Okay, that's important. Uh, and there's another piece to this, that most successful ones know that their greatest knowledge is self-knowledge. So they're not studying something else, they're studying themselves to some degree, and they're trying to offset their weaknesses. So the better you understand yourself, the better you can build something around you that is greater than yourself, the more inclined you are to become an entrepreneur. And remember, entrepreneurialism is centered around businesses, principally businesses, so it's going to take more people more understanding, more talents than typically any one person has. So with that, um, I think if anybody considers going out and starting a business, they should look a little bit at themselves first. Talk to themselves about what, 
what facets of risk they're willing to take, both personal, economic, um, legal. <laughs> Believe it or not, you build a business and you're going to find that there's a lot of legal constructs that you have to learn about. Um, what motivates you? Are you motivated for the big dollar? Are you motivated to enhance your community? Are you motivated for some sort of personal um, uh, attribution or benefit? Uh, do you just love the technology and want to see people use it? So what are your intrinsic motivations? Um, what's your inner relationship style? Are you a loner? Do you want to be in the lab all day long or do you want to be out talking to people, specifically customers, and motivating those that are around you to work on your behalf? Um, are you an expert and always in charge? Or do you like to collaborate and get other people's ideas? And then finally, do you have a sense of the future, both optimistic, pessimistic? Are you a half empty or half full kind of person? Uh, entrepreneurs in general uh, have unbridled optimism that is somewhat governed by a realistic uh, present day view. What do I have to do today to realize that optimistic outcome in the end? Uh, so, with that, before you start a business, you have to have an idea, right? I don't know if you can read this, but this is Einstein. He's saying, good ideas emerging from chaos, asterisk. And then down here it says, but there are no dice. And this is sort of a play. You know, Einstein didn't believe that, that God would build a world, a natural world, that involved probability or chance. And that's fine. That's okay. But I think the development of ideas does require a little bit of chance, and it is somewhat of a chaotic process. And so just like this gentleman up in front whose ideas are unconnected and unbounded, the ideation process is all about that. When you construct an idea, you shouldn't constrain yourself too much. Um, and in fact, if you wanted to use some dice, it's okay. But at the end of the day, if you're going to construct a business, you really want it to be as deterministic as possible. And so this is where the planning the process, uh, evaluation, uh, understanding contingency plans, to the extent possible, be as deterministic as you can. So I think you got it right. Um, you, you really don't want chance to play too great a role in your success, but when you're first starting out with an idea, uh, the more ideas, the less boundedness they could, or the less bounds they could have, the better off you're going to be. And then, oh, I'm sorry. So. The, and the thing to recognize is that, that ideation itself can come up with good, bad, or indifferent ideas. It doesn't really matter. The, the focus is to have a lot of them to choose from so that when you go through the process of developing a business plan, you have alternatives rather than simply one that you're trying to make work. So I thought I'd give you an example. Here's a couple guys. They believe that they came up with the first barbell in the world, and you know, they're trying to work out, and maybe that's a wheel. <laughs> maybe that's a barbell. I thought this might be a good example of early Bluetooth. Um, they kind of got it right. It's short range, but the wireless concept missed them. That's OK, though. They're, they're starting out. Uh, this one I couldn't really figure out. And if you guys had some ideas, that'd be great. It looks like uh, a hotel uh, on wheels on the ocean. So uh, you can get creative. You can maybe say that he's creating sushi on the fly with a big blade, and everybody's going to eat well. I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, this one caught my fancy. Somebody who either has to be clean all the time or just has poor scheduling, right? So they, they kind of have to sit in the tub while they're, they're going to their appointment. The only problem with this is I don't see a towel. So, you know, you go into every appointment wet, which could be fun. But um, this one is certainly the mother of, of necessity and invention. Uh, probably appropriate for a football game or something. I, I guess he just can't put the bottle opener in the pocket. has to have it on the bill of the cap. Um, and then finally, this one, uh, you know, I labeled this the good, the strange, and the dangerous, and, and this is the dangerous. Uh, so these are all ideas, not all businesses. This is a staircase, believe it or not, somebody built. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what happens here. You, know, you either have very small feet, if you want to go down the center, or you have to be very agile and sort of skip from side to side. So probably not a good business idea, but an interesting, interesting idea. So, uh, the, probably, yeah, it could be the mother-in-law up there, I don't know. Uh, so, so the idea is that, that not, all, not all ideas are good, um, and certainly not all ideas are businesses. Um, so ask yourself, is it a business, right? 
And this is where the work comes in, because coming up with ideas is only part of it, but can you generate uh, a sound and uh, repeatable business model that provides you uh, sustainable income, provides your community some, uh, some sort of benefit? So things to consider are, you know, what type of business are you going to be involved in? Um, and principally, that's a question about what are you, what are you selling? What, what's your value proposition to everybody around you? Um, are you a products business, a service business, a technology business? And each one of those has its own assumptions associated with how it will perform, where it will fit in the community of businesses and industry, and also a little bit about your profit margins and your capital requirements. Um, key addressable markets, this is a concept about who is your customer? Uh, where are they regionally? What are they interested in? What are the constraints associated with what you're offering? What are their alternatives? Um, how important is what you do to what your customers need or want? Uh, that's proportional to what sort of a value you can, you can obtain in your goods or services, and, and uh, fundamentally what sort of an income you can derive from it. And then finally, um, when you think about timing or starting a business, what, what sort of capital obligation are you walking into? If it's a capitally intensive business like um, semiconductor chip manufacturing is billions and billions of dollars every time Intel wants to make a new fab, uh, ask yourself, are you credible enough to warrant a billion dollar investment? Right? That's just a fundamental question, I guess. Um, what's the business cycle? So how often are you going to be able to produce cash? And how often are you going to need cash to support the, uh, the business obligation, the inventory, the employee base? And then finally, um, what phase of your business or what phase is your business in the general marketplace? Are you ahead of a market adoption curve? Are you behind it? Uh, that's going to play into uh, the novelty of what you do, how long you have to wait, and how hard it's going to be to convince somebody that what you have is of value. And one example that I like is the Apple Newton. I think they nailed it, but they nailed it 15 years early, and now you see it in the iPhone. And many of you may not know what the Apple Newton is, and, and that's fine, but it's the iPhone 15 to 20 years ago. Um, at any rate, so if you're gonna if you're gonna have a great idea and you're gonna think about the context of a business, I think it's important to just contemplate uh, some of these ideas or, or some of these um, attributes of business. And and. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, people, people start businesses for a lot of reasons. Um, I, can, I can give you, for every single person, I'm sure there's a unique concept around why they want to start the business. But if you divorce yourself from the fact that a business needs to make money, um, then I think there's going to be a, a difficulty between you operating that business and actually realizing um, having something that's sustained over time. So, the fact is that, that, that companies have a reason to be in business. They, they interpret market needs. They uh, deliver goods and services. They, they extract differential value. And then fundamentally, they provide a return on that value um, and return on the assets. Those assets are the people's time, the fundamental capital engaged, and um, the goods and inventory that they, that they buy and, and transmit. Are there any questions? Am I going too fast, too loud, too soft, anything? No feedback at all? Okay. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to think about your business. Uh, you need to think about your business relative to your customers, but also your business relative to the industry. And this chart uh, drives home a point that says there's a hierarchy uh, in industry fundamentally. Uh, you do have market leaders that focus on applications and markets. Nokia would be an example of a cell phone company that started out, um, uh, Nokia and Motorola, started out with technology basis in their phones. Um, they almost completely outsource the integration and manufacturing of their phones now. They're principally a market and application focused company. And so they sit at the very highest level of the value chain in industry. And you wouldn't know that because they started out principally as a technology company. So they looked an awful lot like um, a Qualcomm at one point in time or a Sony at one point. There's a technology layer to Sony. Um, so it's important to understand if you are uh, a technology-based company and you believe that that's what you bring in terms of value to industry, you're one or two layers removed from most of the end user applications. And it's those end user applications that drive the majority of value and they drive the majority of the decisions. Um, with the exceptions of a couple companies, can anybody name one technology company that's 
on the forefront of making decisions in our in the United States and the world abroad right now? Tech, what's that? Google, Google maybe, maybe. But get more fundamental than that. Yeah, M more base technology. Which one? Intel. Intel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Intel. Intel sits here, and they control from up here, which is pretty remarkable. Um, it's not often that you get that, but they're they're a great example. Uh, so so the point of this is to determine where. Um, well, A, to understand that there is this hierarchy of value in every industry, and B, to determine what it is that you as an entrepreneur are going to bring to this value chain. If you're principally focused on technology, then that's going to decide a lot of things about the nature of your business. Um, Intel notwithstanding, most technology companies are seen or not seen. Uh, they're embedded inside somebody else's product and that product then is wrapped around somebody else's application. So you're two or three levels removed from the end, the end game, if you will. Um, this will drive uh, the type of business arrangements that you make. It'll drive the core competency within the company. Um, it will drive uh, the capital obligations that you have uh, for your own company as well. It'll also probably drive the, the, the profit margins. Um, Again, everybody in this value chain is going to extract the same dollar from the, from the consumer. Um, and at each, at each stage, that dollar gets smaller and smaller. So I wanted to just give one example of, uh, of what's going on, in, in, I think, in the industry. And, and hopefully it will give you a sense of what the, the stratification is. But if you look at entertainment in general, what we used to have were major networks that provided content. And those, those networks dictated everything about what we saw, when we saw it, and also all of the advertising associated with what we were seeing. And the advertising drove the business, right? The advertising paid, much like Google does today, and Google clicks and information. The advertising drove um, our content coming free to us, but the network's making money. So three, at one point in time, moved over to cable media, now you've got a few more with specialty information flowing, right? You've got the Disney Channel, you've got the Golf Network, um, you've got CNN and MTV, all of which now are, are trying to provide a very directed and focused uh, content to you as the user or as, as, the, uh, as the consumer. And, and by virtue of that, they can get a little bit more value per ad in that space move on to internet media where now a distribution channel is not limited. Everybody has access to the internet. Um, everybody, by virtue of Hi5, MySpace, YouTube, everybody is a broadcasting channel. So you think about that for a second. We've got now each one of you can put content online. Each one of us can download that content for free. Um, if you're a, a popular site, you can actually go out and get ads and you can get a revenue stream. So that's all great at the, at the user level and at the producer level. But there's a couple pieces of technology that are impacted here as well. Um, bandwidth has, has gotten consumed at, a, at an enormous rate because now everybody in this room can be a channel, right? So companies that are in the DWDM space, the, the um, broadband network, uh, fiber, um, switch networks, all of those it, the internet itself, the internet service providers, all of those people that play a role in the value chain of entertainment now participate uh, at a different level than they would have if it was just a network media, um, three networks 20 years ago. So a new industry driven by markets that have impacted the technology layer at an extraordinary level. Okay, so an opportunity today to participate in entertainment as a technology player or a producer, which you didn't have 20 years ago. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that, that the product manufacturers and the application, as I said before, the application people drive a lot of the technology decisions. They also drive a lot of the packaging decisions associated with products. So as an entrepreneur um, thinking about new businesses or new business concepts, it would behoove you to think about who in the, in the industry you'd want to participate with and who could provide you the greatest leverage because ultimately these people have the same interest you do. They want to succeed. Intel wants to sell more chips. 
Um, Canon, uh, Canon actually makes the photolithographic steppers for those chips. Um, Sony uh, makes a lot of the, the flat panel displays that are uh, leveraged in the consumer electronics that leverage those chips. So this is a, this is a family of um, uh, commercial participants that are brought together for a common goal of maximizing their value in a marketplace. They have a lot more capital associated with trying to extract that value than you do as a young entrepreneur, but if you can provide them something of value, then you can ride their coattails to some degree. Um, one thing to say about technology companies, again, if you're, if you're down in the, in, like I said, the, uh, the value chain of industry is how are you going to get that domain expertise? Some of that's going to be by living with customers that are two or three layers removed from you. Um, how are you going to make your, your business capitally efficient? Um, what that means is for every dollar that I put into my business, what am I going to get out in terms of income and revenue? Uh, how creative can I be? Uh, in considering different business models so that I don't have to have a large capital infusion to start my business. And then finally, where, where is the greatest uh, position for my business to sit such that the value extraction or the, the um, income that my business can actually get out of that, that uh, value chain can, um, can be optimized? Is all this making sense? <laughs> um, so Ricky had asked me to talk a little bit about the state of the economy today. Um, and before I do that, I just want to point out that, that there's a number of things that affect the, the quality of a business, um, its ability to start fundamentally. Um, and these are more macro factors. So if you think about the government, the stock market, and corporations, all of which participate um, today in a very capital intensive way in the United States. Uh, if you think about that and then think about what your company could potentially do to leverage um, what those three uh, categories are doing, then, then you might understand a little bit more about um, whether or not you're going to have an advantage or a disadvantage. So the government, for example, has just come out with stimulus package after stimulus package. And, and that's, um, we can talk about the financial bailouts and we can talk about the um, sort of the entitlement programs that are being infused right now, but more importantly, one thing to recognize is that the investments that the government is making is in, in infrastructure and new technologies. And that's an opportunity, uh, specifically for a young startup. Uh, the reason being is that there are small business innovative research programs that exist to stimulate uh, new business starts. And if you have a new technology or a, um, a new business concept that could potentially affect infrastructure or affect uh, resource utilization, energy sources, storage, platforms, things like that, batteries, um, then you might have an opportunity to take advantage of what the government is already putting in, in terms of trillions of dollars, not hundreds of dollars. Um, there are also some, uh, some notions in the government that entitlement programs and legacy programs are never going to go away. Entitlement programs would be your health care. Uh, what they're trying to do right now is, is lower the cost of health care so that more of us can participate long term. Um, if you've got a new technology that decreases the cost of care for elderly patients, uh, then you might have an opportunity to uh, get government grant money to support the development of that. Um, likewise, uh, if you have a technology that's going to help uh, with surveillance activity on the borders uh, or in airports, um, you might find that the military programs are, are something for you to look at as a way to augment the capital requirements of your business. Um, one thing to recognize the stock market, uh, it has an, a couple of uh, impacts, one of which is it somewhat dictates the amount of capital available. Sure. You have a question, so. I do. Uh, these stimulus are, they are talking about a few years. You start like now, by the time you Uh, well, I'm not sure if I agree. I would, I would say that the infusion is happening now um, and that specifically if you look not at the infrastructural uh, initiatives that are in place, but if you look over on the new technologies, the, the battery technologies, the, um, the alternative energy technologies and things like that, those are long-term development programs. So the, the initial funding and program development will be today. 
but the, uh, those will become long-term programs over time. A, a great example is the military, to my knowledge, has not gotten smaller in the last 20 years. And they continue to fund um, advanced uh, weapon development, advanced surveillance technologies. Um, and I think that's going to continue. The good news is I think there's going to be a shift. Th that will still exist, but the shift will go towards creating a more sustainable uh, resource environment for the United States. Um, the, the point of this is to start looking now. If, if you have a, a neat technology platform that you think will have an impact, there may be an opportunity for you to leverage, like I said, the, the um, investments that are already going on in the government. Uh, the stock market has, has a couple of different impacts uh, to an entrepreneur, one of which is it dictates the amount of available capital in a couple ways. Um, and I'll show you a slide later, but uh, private equity, institutional capital, also under the private equity umbrella, and then corporate value. And what you have to recognize is that there's an awful lot of, uh, a, a lot of wealth sitting in the stock market. Um, and, and some of that wealth is deployable, but it has dependencies to the performance of the stock market. Um, corporations, for example, uh, their, um, their absolute value is dictated by the, the volume of stock and the price of their stock. And so that allows them to have flexibility with investments. Uh, so if Microsoft goes down or Google goes down by a factor of two, that decreases their ability to make investments in either new technologies, uh, new startup companies, and even hiring plans and things like that. So, so just understand there's a dependency there. Uh, the other piece that you have to recognize, is, especially in the, in the private equity market, um, your investor risk is proportional to how much they, f they believe they have in reserve. So it's not unlike managing your, your own pocketbook. If I've got $20 in my back pocket and somebody asks me for a quarter, I'm probably going to be okay with it. If I've got a quarter and somebody asks me for a quarter, I might struggle with that decision just a little bit. And then finally, um, the, I, I mentioned a little bit about uh, how corporations are, are impacted by the stock market and the float in the stock market, but more importantly, uh, what you might find, and, and this is to an entrepreneur's advantage, is that as corporations feel the pressure of a reduced economy, they try and get creative. And that creativity comes out a couple different ways. One is um, they're more inclined to partner, and they're more inclined to take a risk on a new partner. Uh, so that benefits an entrepreneur or a small company that has an opportunity. Um, that partnering potential takes a couple different uh, uh, it can be flavored a couple different ways. One is you can be their R&D arm, you can be their, uh, their outsourced manufacturer, um, you can be, uh, um, you can help them with their, their delivery of inventory, for example, so you can take a logistics role. Uh, so the good news is uh, corporations are probably going to stick around, but they'll look outside themselves for alternatives to uh, decreasing the pain, so to speak. The other, the other benefit is as corporations feel uh, the economic squeeze, uh, there's typically a layoff curve. And we've seen recently uh, the unemployment numbers have stacked up pretty immensely. Um, that, that's not so good for the corporations. It's fantastic for startups. Two reasons. Um, one is typically a lot of those people want to take control of their own destiny and will become an entrepreneur. Uh, not because they aspired to be one, but because they were sort of forced into that position or decided to take more control over their own um, their own outcome. The other thing that you'll find is that they'll gravitate towards a smaller group because they feel like they have more control. So you end up as a small company being able to attract people with enormous uh, talent, experience, and even uh, sometimes they'll come with their own money uh, to the company and they'll invest in your company. So uh, the dynamics uh, in, these, in these macro um, categories of government, stock market, and corporations all have the ability to impact uh, your entrepreneurial venture so long as you keep it in mind. So I wouldn't look at an economic squeeze as being necessary, necessarily problematic for a startup. There's advantages to it. Okay. Um, I put this slide up simply uh, as a point of reference and that is to remind us all that there are many ways to finance a startup. Okay. Um, so in order, this is private equity, commercial banks, uh, the federal government, and then the value chain. And what I mean by the value chain is those people that are involved in your business, whether they're your customers, your partners, um, they can be a product partner, they can be uh, part of your supply chain. 
anybody who is connected to your product and or service as it goes to market is part of your value chain. And they have a vested interest in your success as you do in theirs. So there's a, a way to finance the business through them. The federal government I, I focused on quite a bit, so I won't go through it too much. Commercial banks is probably what we're most familiar with. Uh, you know, we all go and get a car loan or a school loan or something like that. Uh, and a lot of them have just uh, uh, gotten bailed out, so they're, they're flush with cash. Um, and then private equity, the venture, what people typically call venture capital. Um, I won't run through the slide in detail, but, but what I will point out is, is you may all think that this is money, and it's true it is, uh, but the color of money is important. Everybody who loans you money will have an expectation associated with it, um, and they will have a risk tolerance uh, associated with that as well. So keep that in mind. Um, what I've tried to do is, is articulate uh, across this spectrum what those risks are and the expectation, uh, what the return would be, that's the expectation from the people. Um, how it might be, um, this isn't an easy one, this is, uh, this is what you have to have um, in order to be credible. So for example, private equity, if you're going to go to a venture capitalist, uh, you need to have uh, a business idea in mind and a very good application in mind, uh, but more importantly, you have to have an exit in mind. And that may not be fundamentally what you want as a business. As a business owner, you may be perfectly happy never to sell your business. Um, and, and believe me, there's, there's plenty of good examples of, of private businesses that have never sold, they've never exited. But um, in order for private equity to get their money back from this investment, there has to be an exit, which means the founder has to sell at some level. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, the founders typically will change, uh, they'll give up some ownership and control in their company, so they're bringing on a partner within their company. That's very different than a bank. A bank doesn't necessarily take a position in your company, they take collateral. And so they ask you to uh, leverage the equipment, leverage the home, leverage anything else that can be sold in case the business doesn't work. Uh, the government's probably the most uh, reasonable in terms of expectation, but they don't pay a huge uh, premium in terms of um, in terms of uh, income, so you can provide a technology solution vis-a-vis -a, -vis a proposal, and you can get enough money to start your business that way. Uh, they provide you cost coverage for your your effort. In other words, your salary is paid plus a little bit of fringe, um, but it's not going to be an enormously profitable uh, way to run a business. So only use it as a as a um, an augmentation to your capital strategy. Yes. going here? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of reasons to do it. Um, VCs are, are extremely acute at helping businesses grow because that's the business they're in. The government is not. Um, they are very focused on the outcome and that helps build all of the uh, sort of all of the appendages necessary to make that business attractive both from a profitability standpoint as well as if I'm going to sell it to the public market, what does it have to look like legally? Uh, what is the business construct around it? How solid is it? So it can't be a, um, uh, a business with a lot of perforation, so to speak. Um, so there, is, there are very good reasons, very sound reasons here. The other thing is if you need, if, if you've got a capitally intensive business, one that needs a million dollars today, five million tomorrow, 30 million the next day, this is a very good place to go. The government won't do that. Um, and and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of barriers to doing that in the federal sector. Um, one of them is prime contractors. Prime contractors, the Lockheeds of the world, the Boeings, the um, Northrop's and the Raytheon's want to own the 50 million to 4 billion, 5 billion space. And so they don't, they don't allow for a young upstart to get up into that stratosphere very easily. So the size of your business will be constrained just based on the stratification of the of the federal sector. Does that answer it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I also wanted to give uh, sort of the where we're at today. This is a 10-year snapshot of the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the 9,000 is a tech index. And this is important because, again, um, you have to recognize that there are dependencies, your ability to start the business, capitalize the business, and then operate 
in um, a competitive landscape where there's already existing businesses. So the NASDAQ right now is off about 150% from its peak in 2000, and we all remember that as uh, either the dot-com bubble or the telecom bubble, depending on how you wanted to look at it. Um, the Dow Jones is at its lowest level in 10 years, and I, I brought the tech sector in only, uh, actually as a follow-on or a, a precursor to the next slide, to show that the DAC and the, uh, and the tech sector, this is a pullout. The tech sector is something that's only, uh, only populated with technology-related companies. The NASDAQ, has a, it's a composite that has both tech and non-tech. And you can see in the, in the 2000 time frame, they were almost one for one. And there's been a divergence over the last um, seven years or so. Uh, and that's important to recognize. Uh, the SMA 50. Oh, that is, I believe, um, and I didn't, I didn't put it on there on purpose. It's probably a 50. It's got to be a probably a 50 month or a 50 week um, boxcar average. So it's not very meaningful, um, not for the purpose of this. The zero. Oh, the crossover point. So there's a there's a reference. Um, yeah, so this is all relative to growth. So you start growth at zero. Yeah. And um, if we had put on absolute scales, if you weren't trying to compare two indices or two stocks, then there would be a, uh, an absolute share price on the right-hand side. But since we're doing it and we're trying to compare the values, the relative values from this point in time, then you can see that, that the, uh, the NASDAQ was off the charts. If you had $100 in, you would have ended up with a couple thousand, you know, in you know. In 2000, 2001. Uh, but likewise, you would have lost 45 bucks in <laughs> today. Um, so there's, there's a couple of points I want to make. One is, as I've, I've pointed out before, the stock market is sort of a holding tank for available capital. And that comes out in a couple different ways. One is pension funds typically will operate by having uh, enormous amounts of money, billions and billions of dollars, uh, operating in the um, in the stock market, trading on a regular basis. Those pension funds are also uh, heavy contributors to uh, venture capital funds. What you'll find is that they've got a, a risk reward structure that the high risk, high return, maybe 5% of the entire pension fund is given over to uh, large venture capital companies to go ahead and invest in small, small companies. Um, so as the, as the stock market fluctuates, uh, you can see today we've got uh, tremendous reduced value, which also means that there's a reduced availability of liquid, of liquid cash or uh, investable funds for startups. Um, that affects, as I mentioned before, both the institutional capital and the private equity groups. The other thing to point out is that investors have, have shifted their values to some degree. And, and what I mean by this is their risk tolerance um, will drive a number of decisions, most importantly, where their capital goes, okay? So as I mentioned, if I've got a, a wallet full of 20s and, and somebody asks me for a quarter, that's fine. I probably don't have any problem with that. Um, but I'm gonna change my perspective view if that request becomes uh, more, more closely aligned with my limits. Um, and you can see this today. If, if NASDAQ was the star child of 2000 um, with tech heavy stocks, the Googles of the world, the Intels of the world, um, we can go through uh, JDSU, Agilent, uh, you'll see those later. Investors now have put their money in Alcoa, American Express, Boeing, Citicorp, Caterpillar. These are staged companies. These are old, heavy capital, uh, big industry companies. Um, Alcoa is an aluminum company. So you'll find that, that um, even in the, in the private equity, organi um, with private equity orientation, my risk tolerance has changed as well. The types of businesses I'm interested in investing in is proportional to the amount of float or the amount of capital I have available. You can see it in the macro markets as well. People have gone away from tech and they've gone to something that's more tried and true, a little bit more stable. How long would you say it takes for a big market move to sort of bleed all the way through to your rank and file? Um, explain that to me. What do you mean by a big market move? Say that Uh, you're going to see it. Are, are we at the bottom now from that? 
Yeah, they, they have pulled back. I've got a, a news clipping that you'll see. Um, they have been reeling pretty heavily. So what, what that means is uh, if I'm in a large venture capital organization and I've got $100 million into a company, and that company, and I've committed to another $20 million, that company asked me for my $20 million. I look to my fund, my stock market fund, do I have $20 million available? Maybe not. Maybe I can pull out five now. And so what you'll find is their behaviors will change. Their, their um, willingness to meet that commitment is going to be uh, stretched out to the extent that they possibly can. Um, and there's, a, there's one slide that addresses what's happening right now in VC. Does, it, does that help? Okay. Oh, here it is. So this is um, Bloomberg as of uh, the 26th of January. Um, venture capital investment dropped 33 percent in the fourth quarter of 2008, hammered by a recession that drove software deals, and this is important, to their lowest level in a decade, lowest level in a decade, and cut across, cut access to capital for alternative energy firms. Why is that important? Alternative energy is highly capital intensive. What I mean by that is you're buying big, big pieces of equipment or you've got huge real estate development requirements or you've got technology development that's not here yet in the material sciences, which looks a lot like biopharma and biotech. It just takes an awful lot of money to get to move the needle on advancement. And what they're saying here is, as a result of the, of the depression of the stock market, their ability to fund those types of investments has gone way down. And their tolerance and interest, what we call appetite, has also gone down. Um, this is also interesting. Software investing dropped to $1 billion, the lowest quarterly level in 10 years. Why is that important? Software investments are the most capital efficient investments because they don't have to buy a whole lot of real estate. They don't have to buy a whole lot of um, large machines. Uh, and the return, the income return on printing uh, software is huge. So again, this just reiterates the fact that if the stock market's down, the investment community is also down. What I did like is um, that you'll see a pickup in venture, uh, not in the first half of 2009, but certainly through the year. And I think that's important. Typically, these people are looking five years out, seven years out, for what markets and what industries are they typically going to place a bet on. And so what they're saying is, I think I've flushed it all out. I'm going to hold for a little while longer. And at the end of this year, I'm going to start to redeploy. Okay. Not that they're perfect prognosticators, but, but these are the guys who are paid to look, like I said, on the five and seven year time horizon. Um, so let's counter that with some other news. This is uh, 212, 209, 219, 209, small business in the New York Times. Uh, opportunity knocks for entrepreneurs, even in bad times, and the venturesome set out. And the reason I bring this up, oh, and there's a third. Door-to-door uh, -door hookahs. So I saw this today. This is fantastic. I'm loving this guy. So Michael Phelps lost a multi-million dollar contract for a photograph just like this. Right? Did you guys see this at all? Yeah. Okay, some did. So this guy's smoking out of a hookah, and I guess he's schlepping these things around campus. He gets in a car and he sells hookahs out of his car. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and if you had Michael Phelps right next to him, it'd be fantastic. Anyway, um, so there's an entrepreneur right in your back door. This is the Boulder Biz. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, Colorado Daily. Okay. Um, the other thing important to note is, is what is the activity level in the, in the venture capital community? So uh, this is one way to assess um, people's uh, interest and their optimism. So there were 41 financings in the week of 216 four mergers and acquisitions. And what you might see in a, in a downturn is more mergers and acquisitions, uh, people coming together to strengthen, you know, peer to peer. They, they can't battle it out um, against each other. It's a waste of resources, so they'd rather align. So you'll see more of that. Uh, in addition, the 41 financings. I just pulled a few. Twitter, you probably know, 35 million. Um, some big names behind it. Benchmark Capital is a huge investment firm. Um, Zio Group, this is local. I don't know anything about them, so I'm going to go look at them. Uh, but I wanted to just say it's not happening only in Silicon Valley. Um, the other one I wanted to point out was Inside Contactless. It's $52 million, and the company that made the investment is Qualcomm. So it's not just the venture capital community that's making a bet, right? Qualcomm's an institutional company. 
or a, uh, that's a corporation. So the thing to note here is you're seeing a, an investment across stages, both early and late stage, and that's really important. If they were only later stage uh, investments, what, what I mean by that is uh, something in the Series C, Series D means it's gone three, four, and five rounds of investment to grow. Uh, people have already made this commitment. They've made it. Uh, Norwest Ventures has probably been in. Sequoia has been in from the beginning, which means that their money is already to work, and they're sort of forced to continue to invest in order to make this a healthy investment. So if you only saw late-stage investments, then you would say nobody's taking a risk. They're only um, ensuring the risk that they've already taken. However, uh, this is new. Um, I think Omni is new. Series E is really late and I believe inside is new. So early stage, people taking a bet, making a bet today in today's climate. Um, you're seeing both institutional and corporate capital, that's important, that's why I brought up the Qualcomm. Um, they're participating, what that means is they're investing in their future by going out and looking at, at young entrepreneurial companies as a way to augment their research strategy or their channel strategy. Um, you're seeing a, a diversification in the size of the round, so some of these are probably a couple million dollars, but the 52 million was nice to see. Uh, 20 million at a Series E is spectacular. Um, you're seeing both local and international interests, and then finally, uh, sold to syndicated participation. Um, sometimes what you'll find is, is as things get tight, uh, investors will look to diversify their risk by bringing on other investors, and that's, that's natural and to be expected, um, but it's not the only condition. There were, out of the 41, uh, there were single, uh, single firms that went to the table and made the, and made the bet. Sure, please. How does that compare to another piece of Oh, good. I, yeah. Well, let me, um, I'll give you a reference. There's the, um, the, Natch, the National Venture Capital Association, and they keep those statistics. I unfortunately didn't have time. I, I do have a couple slides from a year ago that would show the trend on a monthly basis, but um, I just didn't have time, and I thought it would be too focused for this, for this audience. My question was where do you get this type of information? So is there yeah. that? National Venture Capital would be a great place to start. Yeah, um, this, this came out of the Venator report. The, the, this is just a text-based, um, uh, not an online magazine, but almost like an online uh, newsletter that comes out. Uh, so I've highlighted up at the top, Venator, you can just go to venator.com and find, and it'll give you output like this. The National Venture Capital Association will monitor deal type deal frequency, deal value. So you'll get a lot more detail uh, from there. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, so so one, might, one might ask, when, when is a technology company cool relative to say a product or application company? And I would argue um, when it makes the headlines. And uh, you can see, I, I don't think I'm gonna expose the company, but you can see what happened I've already shown this chart uh, as NASDAQ, but this is truly a company. Um, and what you find is that it wasn't one, it was four. So both Agilent, or Agilent Intel, Corning, and JDSU all made the headlines, and this is right around the bubble. The point is you probably didn't hear about a whole lot of these companies. Uh, they did extraordinarily well, and they were in the headlines. People were getting uh, venture financing uh, for just being able to talk about what a photon was at that time. And it was a fantastic time to be in, in optics. Um, and I came out of optics, so I had an interest. Uh, nonetheless, uh, technology companies can do well, and it can be cool to be on the inside or in the infrastructure, um, or maybe even behind the scenes if you do it right. Um, and with that, does anybody know what happened in 05? So I just showed you the 01 bubble, but something happened in 05. It was fantastic. Anybody? Nobody knows what happened in 05. Well, I sold a company in 05, but that doesn't count. Okay, well, any uh, baseball fans? One baseball fan, two. Red Sox, how about the White Sox? Right? Yeah, so that was fantastic. 88 years, <laughs> and they finally did it. And, and that's okay, but it's outside the context of this. This is really what I wanted to focus on. <laughs> this guy is Greg Olson. He uh, sold his company not once, but twice. Sold the first time for, uh, let me see, $700 million. That's fantastic. It was a SBIR funded company. What they made were infrared sensors. And he sold at the peak of the telecom bubble to Finisar. Uh, he then bought his company back, or actually the, the employees bought it back with him. 
and he sold it again to Goodrich uh, a few years later. So in, in 2000 he sold it, and then in 2005 he sold it again. And that's him getting ready for a flight, uh, I, I think it's um, on one of the Russian uh, spacecraft. Uh, he ended up not going, but nonetheless he spent his 30 million for the ticket. So I'll just leave you with a few things. Um, one is, if you're going to start a company, start with yourself first. Uh, I think it's important to do that anytime you make a large, large scale transition in your life. You're going to get married sometime, talk to yourself. You're going to go out and buy a big house, talk to yourself. I think that's important. Uh, but nonetheless, if you're going to start a business, there are facets to who you are that may not be congruent with starting that business. And so long as you learn those things and you know them, you can augment. And, uh, and protect against them or, or help yourself. Um, I would say if you're interested, start it now. Start the process now. Ricky asked me, is this a great time to start a business? If you're interested, it's always a great time to start a business. And uh, there's ways to make it work. Um, the only caution I would add is uh, get some help. Don't do it on your own. Reach out to the people that know who you are, uh, know what it is that you want to do, and let them help you and, and get that network started as quickly as possible, specifically around the business issues that you may not have the experience um, to tackle right away. Uh, the point of starting is if you never start, uh, you won't learn a lot of the things, a lot of the details about the business, the market, the technology, yourself, that a lot of us who have a few more scars have learned, perhaps. Um, I would say try not to be insulated. Don't, uh, don't confine yourself to the bubble of your own thinking and challenge yourself by getting new perspectives and new ideas and constantly ask somebody to, to poke you in, in the noggin and say, is this really what I should be doing? Not, not should I be starting a business, but is this what I should be doing from a business idea standpoint? And, and you know, expand yourself in that way. Um, I can't harp on this enough. I've said it a lot, but application and domain knowledge is intrinsically important. You can you can have a great idea, you can have a fundamental technology that just has no legs, can't go anywhere. And principally what we find is that people haven't done the customer's customer's work yet. So you have a technology, it's purchased by somebody who's purchasing something else from them. Um, and you find that you get, you get too far removed from the end application to really understand the value of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And so the, the more you look at how your technology can be applied in a domain by an end user, I think the better off you'll be and the more poignant you'll be in the, um, in the delivery of that technology. And that's it, miracles can happen. As I pointed out, uh, this guy right here, he's a miracle, he's pretty amazing. So that's it. There are some references, I'll, I'll hand this out or I'll give it to Ricky. And that's it, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Boredom? Utter boredom? So, as a, an aspiring entrepreneur, what's the best way to go about determining whether there is a market for the mic you're going to have? How, what's, what's the best way to approach market research? Mm -hmm. I'd say three things. Um, one is uh, look for alternatives doing it, number one. So, you can do your internet searches, your academic research. Um, that's what they call secondary research, right? Um, and then I would go primary. I would go to the five or six main line customers that you think would be the premier. Envision your business five years from now already up and running, doing what it does at the highest level that it possibly can. Who would be attracted to your product, service, or value, right? And go talk to them. Pick up the phone. It, you'd be amazed at, at how um, available people are to your idea and um, and your interest simply because you're enthusiastic about it. That's the first one. What else? Okay. All right. Sure. So as you start up, how many of those levels do you think you should meet before you declare you have a product? Levels. Well, you mean you talked about the technology level all the way up. Oh, you can start a you can start a um, you can start a business in any one of them. Um, the point there. The point of that slide was to just recognize that it is that every industry is, stra is stratified. Um, so Intel, it resides here. Um, but Intel started before the market security. Oh, that's fine. That's that's fine. Um, so we could talk about Apple. Where would you put Apple on that as a company? I mean, 
Apple would have been able to too. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So you don't, you don't have to own them all. The, the point was just to understand where you're at because that means that if you're only going to occupy one, then you don't have the other ones and you have to augment your company with that information. So what it says here is that, that this is the market and business level and this drives all the requirements down, right? And, and you know that because cell phone manufacturers decide um, what it looks like, what kind of technology goes on um, on the inside. RIM just made you know, a tremendous, uh, the BlackBerry people just made a tremendous faux pas, right? They said, I want to have a touch screen. And they drove touch screen requirement down to the technology layer. And they said, fine, I got a touch screen. But they didn't augment their user interface. <laughs> so all of a sudden, it's a very awkward touch screen to use. You know, it's not like the iPhone at all. Um, but they were RIM, they owned the market and they owned the application and they decided that that's the technology they want to have and somebody had to produce it. Um, all I'm saying is recognize that your business will have certain requirements placed on it depending on where you start in this stratification. Yeah, go ahead. Well, so follow on to this question sure. about doing market research. If the market doesn't exist yet, is it best to just go to people who think will buy it? Well, that, that, that was going to be the one thing that I forgot to say is that the best endorsement is somebody <laughs> paying for what it is that you do, right? Um, and that's what we're really striving for in a business is that, that transaction where dollar equals value or maybe um, dollar equals 10 times value because it's perceived. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the, that's the best endorsement for uh, what your business is providing to a community. So yeah, if it doesn't, if you don't believe that market exists yet because it's a technology widget that's unbounded, then the ideation process is important to jump ahead to potential uses and test market that against um, companies that potentially have an interest in, or maybe an adjacent interest in that concept. I, I wouldn't force them to go through the how would you use this technology. That's a hard one. Um, it's evangelistic, which is typically extremely hard, um, and people get wrapped up in the what do you have versus what does it do. If you can get to the what does it do, then they don't care how it does it. Unless it's a stint or something going on in the body, then they, they care at some point. But. So we probably need to... Oh, I got one more and then... So with this new government That's, that's the principle. That's the principle one. What I would say is that there's been a shift. Um, so whereas you might have gone to the Air Force and the Navy and the military uh, organizations initially, uh, I would be looking at NSF and NIH as those bodies that are going to get more and more uh, subsidy dollars over time to filter through the Small Business Innovative Research Program. Um, and there are other programs underneath that umbrella. Uh, there's a tech transfer program. You, you're probably more familiar than I am now. Um, so that's one answer. The other answer would be look to those companies, the large companies, who are aligned very well with the federal government. Look to GE. Why, why is GE important? Because they're, they're embedded in medical science right now. The, you know, the MRI technology, the functional MRI technology. Um, is astounding and it's only going to get better. So to the extent that they can influence government to move money over into their R&D, they will do so. And to the extent that your business can help them, you will benefit. Yeah. Okay. okay. I put one to sleep though. I know that. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Hey, thank you all for coming by the way. I appreciate it.